So there you have it. This account then in Mark 6 of the feeding of 5,000 adult males with five bread rolls and, rolls and two sardines. It is completely unique, isn't it? It's completely unique. It's just unique in the facts of things. But it, in fact, it is unique because it is in fact the only miracle of Jesus that's recorded for us in all four Gospels. All four Gospels. Only one miracle common to all of them, and this is it. You know, we've got the three synoptic Gospels. They're called synoptic because they seem to be seeking to get things in the right order and so on. That word synoptic means, well, op the optic bit is to see, and the sin bit is not S-I-N, S-Y-N, is together. So seeing it all together. It's an orderly account, as Luke describes his Gospel in particular. You've got three, and they are seeing things together. But what, why aren't they all just the same? Why haven't we got four accounts that are the same? Um, by definition, each Gospel writer has got an eyewitness account to offer. It's his account. But each selected the stories about Jesus that would be incorporated in their Gospel because, like eyewitnesses anywhere, genuine eyewitnesses anywhere, of genuine events, they emphasise different things as being more significant. Luke is coming at the events of Jesus' life from a particular perspective of an intellectual guy, an academic guy, a trained physician, and so on, trying to put together an academically sort of sorted out history, but really interested in the miraculous side of what Jesus did. And Mark is telling a good yarn. I mean, Mark is really telling a good yarn. You can tell by the way he fills in so many of the bits and pieces that others don't tell us. He fills in the story, because... We've seen this. We believe he's writing for oral learners. We know the church in Rome had lots of slaves in it. Now, they could have been intellectual slaves. They could have been well-educated, but a lot of them weren't. He's writing for all sorts of people. We know there were soldiers in Caesar's household. A lot of army types haven't necessarily been the brightest academics in the world. He's telling a story and structuring it in a particular way, but he's telling it from Peter's perspective on things. Well, how invaluable is that? But see, Peter's a different sort of guy to John. If you had one person's perspective on me, right? Try it like this. If you had one person's perspective on me and what I've said and done, heaven forbid, you could end up getting a very inaccurate picture of me, couldn't you? You wouldn't have a balanced picture. You'd have one perspective. And anybody selecting events and so on and putting together a story of a life is going to select certain things about the person. And it's not a rounded picture of that person. It's not a 3D picture, it's flat. And it's from one angle. You're not getting the full picture. But if you're getting it from a range of people and they're telling you and emphasising different things and so on, you're getting a much more rounded picture of the real Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Well, no wonder God chose four Gospels for us to have then. And then he's got three from that sort of narrative sort of account, and he's got one from an analytical perspective. He's got John. See how it works? It's clever, isn't it? And for, for centuries, oh, for certainly a long time, scholars have been saying, oh, the synoptic problem, as if they're contradicting each other. And actually what you've got is different guys take on it, and you're getting a rounded picture of the whole thing. Well, that's, that's sort of simplifying and going quickly through an awful lot of theology that happens, right? But, but it's worth thinking that, isn't it? Thinking about that. But the interesting thing is that all four of those, coming from their different perspectives, different people, different characters, different patterns of thought and different purposes, you know, whether it's synoptic or whether it's more analytical, theological, they all include this one miracle about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. It must be really important then, mustn't it? The more so when you, when you realise that about 90% of the content in Matthew, Mark and Luke is broadly the same stuff. They share about 90% of their content, Matthew, Mark and Luke. But 90% of John is in none of the other Gospels. <laughs> roughly. We're talking roughly here. John is particularly interested in Jesus' miracles, which he calls signs, the signs of Jesus the Messiah. Yet this is the only miracle that John includes that's also shared by the other three synoptic Gospels. I'm trying to show you this has got to be pretty significant. Now, I, I've suffered from second-hand, because I didn't get Sunday school, but I, I'm, I'm suffering second-hand from other people's Sunday school take on the feeding of the 5,000. Now then, boys and girls, it was a lovely day, and the grass was green, and the tablecloths came out, and the picnic hampers came along, and... and 
this is a, a mind-shatteringly important, mind-shatteringly significant account. It's in all three, and very little else is. Well, nothing else is. This is important. They've all given this incident, then, a very great deal of significance, telling us something highly, highly relevant about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is very prominent in the Gospel accounts. So why? Well, for once, um, for once, the, the, the general structure of what's happening around this little passage in Mark is, is helpful, but it's not, it's not decisive for us. What's happening here? Well, you know, we, we saw this last time. You've got that first section, part A, we're calling it. Jesus sends out the twelve, death of, death of John the Baptist, the twelve return. We've got that sandwich there. Uh, and what that's showing us is that, you know, in, in, a, in a world that's in rebellion against God, when you stand out for the kingdom of God over against the kingdom of darkness, there can be seemingly very significant implications for us in following Jesus in a world like that. The incoming king in a, in a world that's so thoroughly given over to the kingdom of darkness. We, we saw that last time. And then we've got this central section, in, part in this section, part B, where Jesus, first of all, has three encounters with Jewish people, showing himself to be who he is, and then three encounters with Gentile people, showing himself to be who he is. And in the middle, we've got that sort of turning point, that fulcrum, that leverage point around which it all revolves, where Jesus is dealing with God's word and human tradition and what actually makes people unclean. It's not religion. It's not your tradition, it's not your rigmarole. It's what comes out of the heart of a man. And that's an essential part in this training panel of Mark 6, 7 to 8, 30. What's happening is that Jesus, first of all, preached that the kingdom of God was at hand and, and drew disciples, come and follow me. And then he drew 12 together to lead those disciples, yeah? And now in this section, Mark 6, 7 onwards, he is training those guys to be the leaders of the people of God, to model what Christian discipleship, what following Jesus looks like in a situation where the world is in rebellion against God and the kingdom of God is being proclaimed and is coming in. As people are called to repentance, as people are called to faith, as they're called to follow Jesus and become fishers of men. This is the training panel. God remember that. That's roughly what's going on. And this bit today is all about, roughly, about who Jesus is. So the context generally in Mark's Gospel helps us. But actually, the answer to the conundrum of what's going on here in the feeding of the 5,000, it, it, it owes quite a lot to the Old Testament prophetic context. Great prominence, perceived deep significance of this miracle. It, it lies not in the immediate, but back in the Old Testament prophetic context to this passage, writing in a passage looking forward to the end times, Isaiah, and that's the scroll of Isaiah there on the screen for you, Isaiah says this, looking to those end times, looking to when God is going to do what he needs to do in a fallen world. Isaiah 25, 6, the Lord who commands armies will hold a banquet for all the nations on this mountain. It's about a banquet, it's about a feast. Get that in the mind? At this banquet there'll be plenty Meat and aged wine, tender meat, choicest wine. On this mountain he'll swallow up the shroud that is over all the peoples, the woven covering that is over all the nations. You don't wear a shroud to a feast. Go on. He'll swallow up death permanently. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from every face. Picked up again in Revelation, this isn't it? And remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. Indeed, the Lord has announced it. So by the time of Jesus, first century Jews had this concept in their heads of the great messianic banquet in the end times. It's the great end time banquet at which the Messiah, the one who's coming to bring the deliverance of the people of God, bring salvation, he is the host. We would describe it as heaven. They had the messianic banquet. So, you know, all the rejoicing and partying of heaven, which I'm sure we're certain about, they saw that in terms of the messianic banquet. Now the feeding of the 5,000 guys there in Mark 6 is not heaven, is not the messianic banquet, but it is a preview. It's a preview of that. It's a deliberate announcement and a proof that Jesus is, who is Jesus? The King Messiah of prophecy, foreshadowed through the giving of manna in the wilderness in Exodus. He gave them bread from heaven and foretold by the prophets, men like Isaiah, 
and now coming at the incoming of the kingdom of God in Mark 1.15. It isn't there, but it is a foreshadowing as the kingdom is coming in. Do you see? And how are we sure of that? Well, if you want to just say, well, okay, Simon, you know, how are you sure of that? It's no accident when you come to John's account in John's gospel, John 6, 14 and 15, that the crowd comes along immediately after this miracle to try to force Jesus into their mold of what the Messiah was about. They come immediately to seize him and make him their king. They understand that that's what's going on here. They understand now that Jesus is the Messiah, the king over the kingdom of God. He's fed them with this banquet bread from heaven banquet and that's why they mistakenly thought that they should come and make him king that's what they thought the messiah was all about do you see how that makes sense is that making are you happy with that yeah no heckling that's good that's marvelous okay it is incredibly significant then they believe that jesus here takes five thousand jewish people and shows them as the messiah a foreshadowing of salvation of the messianic banquet on that hill as he feeds them with that bread from heaven and it is even more significant perhaps that at the end of this section i showed you there okay at the end of it he's fed five thousand jews with the messianic banquet but by the end He's feeding 4,000 Gentiles in Messianic feast. Okay, so that's basically what's going on. Everybody happy? What's going on in these verses then? Let's see what's happening here. Let's turn to the nitty gritty and see what comes out of it. Let's look at the details of the account. Verses 30 to 33, Mark chapter 6, the apostles are overtired. Now, how do you find it to be faithful and to walk with God and to do the bright and intelligent, sensible, wise, mature Christian thing when you're overtired? I'm sure you all find it really easy, because I do. Not. It's when you're overtired, isn't it? Verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him everything they'd done and taught. They had been out, healing the sick, driving out demons and stuff like that. And they're coming back, boy, we, look what we've been doing. But, you know, it's emotionally draining, isn't it? Preaching the kingdom, driving out demons and healing the sick. I mean, that's, that's a fair day's work. They come back to Jesus, they gather around him, and they told him everything they'd done and taught. There's this feeding back, there's this training going on. And he said to them, come with me privately to an isolated place and rest a while. He perceives their human need. Ministry is draining. Why do you want to do that, Jesus? Because many were coming and going and there was no time to eat. Jesus himself had been busy in his mission base in Capernaum. People coming and going. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a remote, to some remote place. This is a legitimate thing to be doing. Rest time, said Spurgeon, is not waste time. You've got to be tired to rest. You're tired for some reason, yeah? It's not a waste of time to go and renew your resources. And what happens next? Well, the crowd followed. Verse 34. As Jesus came ashore, he saw the large crowd. Oh, no, they followed us around the lake. Oh, no, go away. Don't you know it's my day off? The phone's off the hook. Jesus saw the large crowd and he had compassion on them. Now, this is the big deal. This is the big thing that drives the sort of ministry that comes out of actually following Jesus, right? If you're actually following Jesus, you're doing it because you've got compassion on people. He has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd, so he taught them many things. We've heard a lot, and many books have been written um, in recent days about, uh, well, the last 10 years, really, I suppose, about mercy ministries and stuff like that. Mercy ministries is the, the phrase that Tim Keller, from Presby uh, Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, uses, written famously on the subject. And we've got people who picked that up and others who were feeling the same way, of course. And, uh, they, you know, they want the compassion ministries and mercy ministries. And, and that, the outflow of all of that is the stuff... That, Fresh stuff that's been coming into the churches about food banks and street pastors and a host of things, Christian social involvement. Um, Chris Kandaya is doing a lot with uh, adoption. He's trying to get Christian people to adopt kids and stuff like that. How does Jesus have compassion on poor people, these poor people? How does he have compassion? 
He sets up a food bank. No, he doesn't set up a food bank. He uh, has a Christian housing scheme. He doesn't have a Christian housing scheme. Jesus saw these people and he saw them in their need and he had compassion on them because they were sheep, like sheep without a shepherd and he taught them. He taught them God's word. And gradually it's interesting to see how these things develop in, in the books that get published and so on. Gradually people are beginning to recognise blogs and whatnot speeds up the process these days, doesn't it? You know, the way to have compassion on poor people is to teach them about Jesus because that's how their lives are going to get reorientated and that's how they become the sort of lives you can actually help. And actually, by helping people in that way, they, they're going to last forever. Not just till the next don't check comes. Now those things are all important. Nobody's going to deny any of that. But do you see the point? Jesus has compassion on these people. He does feed them. But his priority is to teach them about the kingdom of God and how to live and walk in God's way. And that is an act of compassion and mercy, Jesus style. We mustn't, in all our seeking to help people materially and so on, which is great, and we love doing that, we mustn't lose track of this. Since the beginning of this section, Jesus' emphasis has been on the training of the twelve. And then he, so he leads them off then in verses 35 to 44 of, of Mark 6 into this big training event. He's been teaching, he's been training them to follow the Lord in his mission, the Lord's mission, announcing the kingdom of God, calling men and women to repentance, to faith, and to, to, to following Jesus by, like him, becoming fishers of men, because that's what he's doing. That's his mission. Follow him, that's what you'll be doing. And here comes a hugely important lesson. Again, we're in the learning by doing stage of their training, because that's, that's what we're on now. Here comes a hugely important lesson in trusting Jesus to be doing the impossible with virtually nothing at all. Now, I don't know when you last heard a sermon on doing the impossible with virtually nothing at all, but it, it's, it's shop window stuff in the mission and the training of Jesus. It's here's how to do the impossible with virtually nothing. It's, it's a basic. Shall I write the book? I'll, I'll try a blog or something. But, but nobody's done that. Where's the emphasis? It is crucial to the ministry of Jesus that these guys are going to learn how to do the impossible, the virtually impossible with nothing at all or virtually nothing at all that is essential in the Gospels to faithfully following Jesus because that is what Jesus himself seems, seems always to be doing the impossible with virtually nothing at all it's already late when it was already late, his disciples came to him, verse 35, and they said, this is an isolated place, and it's already very late. It's not a campsite. Send them away, so they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> what? And they said, should we go and buy bread for, what, 200 silver coins and give it to them to eat? He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Go and see. Loaves? not going to be any. When they came back they said five and two fish and then he directed them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Mark again, doing it again, green grass. Not green grass, but the green grass. Okay? The green grass. He's filling in the, he's, picture, he's painting the story for oral learners so they've got a picture in their minds. Think of it, it's an invitation to imagine this. Get your mind's eyes going and see all those people in groups of 50 and 100 are Blooming army sitting down on the green grass. Green grass because it's springtime. Green grass because the growth has come up before the sun has come out. Green grass and they're sitting on it before it's got burned off in the heat of a Palestinian summer. There's this nice green grass to sit down on. Everything's provided, isn't it? So they reclined in groups of hundreds and fifties. There they are, taking their ease, leaning on their left shoulder in the way of the ancient world to eat their food. It's, it's, it's the Roman way of eating. Who's, Paul write, who's Mark writing for? <laughs> He's writing for Roman people. And he uses the Roman vocabulary of reclining at dinner. I couldn't manage it. Could you manage that? I mean, <laughs> I'd be all over the place. I couldn't manage lying down to eat my dinner. It's hopeless. I can't manage lying down to eat a sandwich. But there it is. He's putting this in their mind's eye. Look, it's already late. 
these people have had a long day. They've come running around the top of the lake to follow after Jesus to get some more. And he's been teaching them all day. How do you feel about long sermons? He's been teaching them all day, okay? And, and the disciples are getting a bit concerned because we're out in the wilderness here. They've gone to the wilderness to get some peace. It's a sparsely populated area. Sparse vegetation, the word that's used there is for a wilderness, an isolated place. And they've come around the top of the lake. Yeah, it's a lot of no. Okay with that? Sorry, yeah, yeah, I know, but it's been written, the account of the Jews is being written for Roman and Roman audience. So he's accommodating himself with his choice of language. So they, they get to this isolated place, it's already late. The disciples have a solution. But, but come on, you haven't got much time. Send them away. Uh, wind up the sermon. Uh, let's get to the point. You know, we need to go. It's getting late, very late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. How do you like the shape of their solution? Is it working for you? Where are they? They're in a desert. The disciples' solution is to send everybody off to Sainsbury's and get some loaves in and they can just go and feed themselves, go home and eat. They've come a very long way there isn't any Sainsbury's. If there are any surrounding villages, the bed, bread is... I've done this. <coughs> I've done this with, with, with Helen. We've, we've got into a cheroot in you know, Palestine and gone up round with the finger of Lebanon and you know, had a look up round there and all the stuff from the past and all the rest of it, a group of people, and gone into the Druze villages. If you go in early enough, you can go into the Druze villages, you can buy Druze bread. They've baked it. You have to bake it every day. It doesn't keep in that climate. Talk to Ben, I mean, he's only in a Mediterranean place. He buys bread every day because it doesn't last. It is already very late. Where's the bread? If there are villages, where's the bread going to be in those villages? How well does bread keep? What do you have to do to it? You're the expert. You know about bread going off. I mean, it's not, this is, there's something wrong. Their thinking isn't, it isn't logical. It's panic-stricken, but it isn't going to work, is it? And even if they do go off into those villages, were those villages expecting 5,000 people suddenly to descend and ask for bread? Well, they've baked enough that morning to do it. You give them something to eat. Because your solution isn't going to work. And now, now the disciples start pulling out their pockets and they start saying, um, you know, uh, 200 silver coins, uh, eight months' wages for us? We're going to go buy that much bread? So Jesus said, okay, let's talk about working with what we've got. Why don't you go and see how many loaves of bread we've got? Now, the people have been out in the desert all day, listening to the sermon, doing whatever. The, the, the picnic they brought with them in a hurried fashion in the morning as they realised Jesus was off and they were going. It, it, you know, it's going to have been eaten gone. That crowd of 5,000 people, you managed to raise five bread rolls and two sardines. Come to that in a minute. Who would you get them from? You know from the other accounts in, in Matthew's Gospel, for example. Who, who's brought this? A little boy. There's a little boy in that crowd whose mummy's packed him up a picnic in the morning. She had in the bag. He's a little few rolls and a few tiny little fish, which is like something to go with it. You know? It's, it's a little bit of protein to go with it. He packed him up his little sandwiches and he's, she sent him off. And he's been so wrapped with the teaching of Jesus, he hasn't touched his lunch. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine many little boys? Who look, he is so wrapped with what Jesus is saying, he hasn't touched his picnic. What do you think it is? He doesn't like fish. No, it was the staple diet. He's taken. That's the sort of preaching we want, isn't it? Pray for that. That's amazing. The miracle here, there's a little boy who's so wrapped with the ministry of Jesus that he's still got his five bread rolls and his two sardines left over. Because he hasn't touched his lunch. Jesus has a plan. It's a stretching one. He assembles those people and he musters them in fifties and hundreds. In the way you would with the assembling and mustering of a military force. Now he's giving them the messianic banquet and he's assembling them and he's mustering them as if they were a military force. This is... What? Sit down on the green grass. 
He's going to do this. But the important principle, the disciples must get their hands first on the bread. They know how many they've got because they've sat down in 50s and 100s. You can look and you can see. How impossible is this? Five bread rolls, two sardines around that lot. First of all, you guys, you followers of me, you've got to get your hands on that bread. Verse 41. He took the five loaves and the two fish that they'd brought him and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves and he gave them to his disciples to serve the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. I mean, these are... These are the little spratty things you see shoaling around the edges of the Sea of Galilee, these, these fish. They're, they're not fish. They are... Mm, break them up. Share them out. You've got to get your hands on it. You've got to get your hands on that inadequate provision for what you know is a massive crowd. Get out there with it. Oh, he gets hold of that bread first of all. We're not going to be asked to follow him down a road he hasn't already travelled himself. He's the first to confront the, humanly speaking, absolute inadequacy of what they've got for their needs. But now you're following me, you've got to get your hands on this food as well. And what does Jesus do? He looks to God for the sufficiency of his provision. I've struggled this week with the sufficiency of God's provision. You can see the video for an example of that. And for all sorts of things. Now, of course, we should make adequate provision if we can. It's no excuse for when we make thoroughly adequate provision for our own wants, thoroughly inadequate provision for the needs of the kingdom of God. There's no excuse for that. But when the Apostle Paul wrote this to the Corinthian believers, he showed he's grasped the lesson Jesus is teaching here. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 3, 5. We have such confidence in God through Christ. Not that we are adequate in, oursel adequate in ourselves to consider anything as if it were coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God. That is essential for following Jesus and for any service in his kingdom. Our sufficiency is of God. He made us adequate to be servants of a new covenant, not based on the letter but on the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, so long as our sufficiency is of God, not the means he's given. Does that make sense? Or 2 Corinthians 9, 8, he says to those people who are making the offering for the Jerusalem church, each one of you should give just as he decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. do not say that in the Bible. There it is, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Yeah? And God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that because you have enough of everything in every way, at all times you will overflow in good work. God who provides seed for the sower bread for food will provide multiply your supply of seed and will cause the harvest of your righteousness to grow our sufficiency is of god when we're all out to serve him so you people here's the bread here's the fish give it jesus takes this inadequate seeming provision that's been offered up by a young follower the picnic lunch of a young boy handed over by this young chap out of his raptness with Jesus. And the Lord performs the function of the head of the Jewish household as if everything were normal. Breaking bread, giving thanks for it. Doesn't he know there isn't going to be enough? Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. The standard Jewish blessing on food. And off it goes. Now for the tricky bit gives the pieces of bread to the anxious disciples. I know exactly how many people there are. He made them count the fifties and hundreds. How many loaves there are? They brought them to him, watched him break them. Right at the point when those disciples are expecting to witness no more than a food riot, he says, go take. Spread it out. Jesus has taken human inadequacy, added what is humanly speaking confusingly inadequate provision for an enormous and challenging need, and out of that, Jesus brings what? Out of that, he brings what every lost soul is looking for. Verses 42 and 4 are all about satisfaction of human need. Verse 42, they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up broken pieces and fish that were left over, 20, 12 baskets full. And there were 5,000 men who ate the bread, by the way. Satisfaction 
for all. No, not satisfaction for all. Satisfaction for everyone who tastes to see that the Lord is good, who waits to see, to taste and see that the Lord is good. It's no good if you saw the inadequacy of the food that was being prayed over and decided there's nothing for you there and left early. Nothing for you. Go see if you can find a village or any bread in it. It's for those who stay to taste and see that the Lord is good. They all ate, those, and they were all satisfied, them, satisfied. More to it, verse 43, this is a great bit. What's this about baskets? They picked up the broken pieces that were left over, 12 baskets full. What's this about baskets? Heavy woven baskets used in first century Galilee, we know about them. Suggestion is they were used like a rucksack, looped over at least one shoulder to go on a journey with and put your stuff in for the journey, it's your kit bag. The key is that there are 12 of them. Why? Have you noticed that? Why does it say 12? We've got 12, 12 disciples here. We've got 12 disciples. One for each of the disciples who are now, no doubt, thoroughly exhausted and whose faith has been thoroughly stretched and tested and who've been utterly strengthened by their training. One each. Why would they need those 12 baskets of food, one each, when they've all been so thoroughly feasted on the green grass there already? They're full. Why do they need a basket? As in our house, all too often, the leftovers are for tomorrow. When God had his Israelite people in the desert and they needed food because they were hungry and he fed them there, he said, sufficient unto the day is your bread, mate, right? You eat your bread and that's it, except one day. Which day? Friday. <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Everybody's awake. You are awake, but not quite. Friday. Yeah, Friday. It was Friday. Friday was an important day. You went out, you gathered enough for two days. The day before their Sabbath. The there's yours for tomorrow. I know you guys are tired. There's your Sabbath bread for tomorrow. Bread from heaven way back then was sufficient for each day. How do you think the bro broken... See, the, the thing with the manna was, if you, if you try to get two days on a Thursday, it went off, yeah? How do you think bread keeps in, in the desert? Not great. Where are they? They're in the heat of the Palestinian sun, okay? When, when you're out in the desert somewhere, perhaps in, in North Africa or whatever, and, and guys come over the horizon on their camels and whatever, and they stop off and you offer them some cheese or something because they like that, and, and, and they share food with you, they don't get bread out of, the, out of the camel. They get couscous. Because couscous is dried grain, and you put a very small amount of water with it, boil it up, and it's brilliant in no time. Yeah? They don't bring bread because bread don't keep in deserts. the same way God allowed collection of manna in the desert the previous day and kept it safe in provision for their needs on God's Sabbath. Somehow, these guys are going to have fresh bread tomorrow because there's 12 basketfuls and Jesus has done this for them. And God has provided for their rest. He's provided rest for his servants on one day in seven and in the eternal messianic banquet in the kingdom of God, which has been foreshadowed by utterly impossible divine provision out of that which is completely inadequate to the needs in this episode of Mark's Gospel we've been looking at. There's this provision the rest of the people of God. There we are, the conclusion word. Did you see the poster around the town this week? On the internet? No, we need to sort our search engine optimization. We really do. There's no such thing as a free, free lunch. Uh, that's um, J.K. Galbraith. J.K. Galbraith, and this is um, Milton Keynes. And there are two economists, one who says, oh yeah, free lunch is good, and the other says, there's no such thing as a free lunch, quite famously. Um, well, if there's no such thing as a free lunch, we've had it, because there's not going to be any messianic banquet for us in the kingdom of God. We're not going to earn it. We're not going to earn our salvation. We're not going to earn our heaven, because we, we can't. There's a free lunch. And Jesus rolls those people up on that mountain, 5,000 men plus others, and he feeds them, and it's free. There's got to be a free lunch, otherwise there's no lunch. Five bread rolls, two sardines, one big idea that could see you satisfied forever. Follow this Jesus. Be part of the kingdom that's coming in. And that's where human satisfaction lies. In self-sacrificing service in the kingdom of God. In turning from sin and trusting Jesus and following him in his way. 
which means becoming a fisher of men. There is nothing. Do you find this? Um, I can be having a really rubbish day and then I get the opportunity to just explain the gospel to somebody and apply it to their life and their situation. And it's, it's as good as a meal. It's better. It's a joy. It's, it's real, it's fun. Am I allowed to say that? It, it's very serious. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I love doing that. To explain to people about the free lunch that is the inheritance of the kingdom of God. We're not talking sandwiches now, are we? We're talking satisfaction, joy, the foreshadowing of eternal satisfaction at the big messianic banquet in glory. It's going to be great. It makes sense because, you know, heaven is all about making much of God, making much of Jesus, and what, what's sharing your faith? So it's like worship, isn't it? Only it's to a person, not to your God. It's making much of him. Human provision is inadequate. Our sufficiency comes only from God, but mere sufficiency is not the heavenly agenda. Satisfaction, human satisfaction as well as God's, is the order of the day, and it's only going to be ultimately found at the messianic banquet. So preaching the good news to the poor is the ultimate act of kindness, inviting them to that banquet which addresses their neediness. The kingdom of God is at hand. And so we need, therefore, most of all, to repent and believe the gospel ourselves and follow Jesus, the fisher of men. Yeah, of course. But there's more. Because when Jesus saw the needs of the people, he met those needs, but he does it out of humanly insufficient means in his hand. And by looking upwards and then acting in complete reliance on the sufficiency that's provided by his heavenly Father, on he goes and look what's happened. 5,000 people fed in the messianic banquet foreshadowing on that mountain that day in the wilderness. He utterly engaged the trembling hands and fearful hearts of his followers in the process. He does that, doesn't he? <laughs> he needs to do that to me. Because we all need to be trained above all else in the absolute sufficiency of our God. You need that for your life's challenges, don't you? To know about leaning on the absolute sufficiency of your God. He's given them training in that on this day. He prepares for them the utterly satisfying heavenly messianic banquet. But he does it through seemingly weak and inadequate means. And they're going to need to learn that if they're going to faithfully follow him. Laying down their lives the way he does in fishing for men. And that is ultimately where satisfaction is found for human beings. In doing that. In laying down your life to follow Jesus in this business of fishing. For, that's where satisfaction is found in this, in this world. Preparing that messianic banquet. Getting your hands on the bread that doesn't seem, doesn't seem like anything. And doing the impossible. Preparing that messianic banquet. So that all who are invited will be there. See, you've got to remember this. And we've got to remember this. When we invite friends for a meal, there's always less at the end than the beginning. Even if I've cooked it. And when Jesus does it, it's the other way around. 